Hi everyone, and um, welcome back to my channel. Today, I'll be doing my top 10 books of 2022. Before I get into that, I wanted to show you this book. I don't know, you can see it uh, now and again. Um, is a indie magazine published in Singapore. Me and my friend contributed a little segment here and I will link our our podcast below. A friend that I went on a walk with is a, a really good friend of mine called Dawn and we have a lot of similar interests in you know, anthropology as well as the climate crisis and you know, she, she does a lot of really interesting research as well so I'm really glad that, that I got to do this with her so yeah check out the little podcast below we've been working on this like for a few months I'm really really proud that it's out here we produce this little leaflet cute right I mean it's a little leaf literally a leaf here really really happy that we did this one of my <laughs> proudest moments of the year that I that I never expected to do let's move on to the actual books that I read this year uh, do you like my little outfit? I thrifted this shirt, it's from Elle. Um, the little mesh top inside is mine. I just felt a bit like, oh, you know, it's the same colour. Maybe I should just like match it together. And it, it's kind of like the holiday season, so a little <laughs> glam look today, I guess. <laughs> I think I can broadly categorise um, my books this year as like, again, um, environmental books um, and more feminist books, I guess, um, but a lot of them still have this kind of inquiry-based approach in the things that they're dealing with, like these books. I don't actually own a lot of the books that I'll be talking about, um, but I, this one I did purchase a copy after I read the library copy because I really liked it. Kind of like a autobiographical account of like a young climate activist who's trying to deal with the impending like impossibility of having a child in the future um, and I guess this was also the start of thinking about the metaphysics of the climate I mean nowadays I've been thinking a lot about that but back when I first picked up this book earlier in the year I was just simply think thinking about very in a very straightforward way I guess like my future and as well like uh, future generations I was just thinking about the literal next generation children who are going to grow up in a changed climate. Um, it was very literal and which is why I also put, picked up The Breaks by Julieta Singh which I then picked as like my created pick for the wormhole. This was a close contender. I either wanted to pick this or The Breaks but I felt like The Breaks had more of an intersection that I wanted to share than this one. Hi Sam. Hmm. Agent P has decided to join us. Yeah, so this was a book um, that was a very close contender to The Breaks. Um, but I sort of chose The Breaks more because it did talk about parenting and, and queer parenting and all that, which I was much more interested in than, you know, Daniel Cheryl, who admits that he is kind of like a very privileged white dude in in the global north um that you know has a girlfriend he has a family he he doesn't think much too much about like the so-called parenting aspect as much as he as he thinks about the more symbolic version of it like he deals with a symbolic child uh, which is why i still uh, chose the breaks over this but i decided to add this in my top books because of its like relevancy to me i mean definitely i'm closer in the age group of Daniel Sherrill and I also feel like the metaphysical aspect of his like struggle um, is something I still um, want to break through and I still want to figure out um, a lot of the sort of emotional and psychological struggles that that um, you know you can't really articulate it's not all physical as much as a lot of the climate crisis is also physical there's a lot of psycho psychological elements that uh, we have yet to have names for we have yet to have like conversations for and i think he touches on those those feelings really well like this um sense of like stasis but also like what do you do when your whole world just like shifts over but everything looks like it's 
per normal. I'm not ranking the books by the way, they're not like in order. But this is one of my top 10 books of the year. I would recommend this to anyone who's like below the age of 35, honestly. Um, considered a youth. Next book that I have um, is also something about the climate crisis and this is The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis by Amitav Ghosh. Now, um, I've talked about Amitav Ghosh's like, work a lot on my channel. But yes, so Amitav Ghosh touches on the literary sort of crisis that we face when writing about the climate, writing about the earth. Um, but in this one, The Nutmeg's Curse, he talks a little bit more about the geopolitical kind of a uh, uh, reluctance to to admit uh, like social injustice and social imbalances like societal imbalances across countries and, and really from a geopolitical point of view uh, so it's not so much literary anymore but really about how you tell history and how you tell like narratives of nation making um, and how we have to really like confront those things if we are really sincere about the climate crisis uh, which is you know I, I don't know why people are not talking about his work as much. Maybe I'm not in those circles because, again, like I do think Amitav Gosh is one of those like classic reads as an environmental student, like environmental studies student, but because I was not an environmental studies student, I've never really encountered anyone who, you know, actually have read his works and have critiques about his work or like would read him in relation to like other authors who write similarly about um, the climate. I guess to me, um, again, I guess picking his book, this one book, um, is definitely, I feel, a good continuation of The Great Arrangement. I also feel like it's a good book to include in kind of a so wider social critique of how we got into the climate crisis because there are a lot of climate books that do talk about like, oh, you know, the scientific elements of it um, or like the different kind of um, solutions that we might have, you know, for example, like Drawdown, that's a very classic example of a book that, you know, outlines all these different solutions. There's also books by like Greta Thunberg or like by other climate activists that it's more like a rallying cry to like gather together, we need to have activism, but I think Amitav Kosh comes from a place of like really critiquing, um, you know, post-colonial impacts and consequences um, and really about like the social order, the world order, how that, you know, historically, that has led to where we are today. Uh, the climate catastrophe is also a catastrophe of capitalism, also a catas catastrophe of colonialism, neo-colonialism, and all that. And, and I think he's one of the authors that really emphasizes that, not just as like a side point, but one that is like really important to address. Um, but I still see that it's not a common conversation in a lot of environmental circles, um, which is, of course, understandable, but um, it's kind of crucial. I, I, yeah, I'm also not too sure how to really like normalize those conversations, but uh, this is one great book to start thinking about it at least and sharing with friends or like even reading circles. Um, so yeah, so that's the second book. Hey, okay, third book that I have is called um, Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows. Uh, I love this book so much. I mean, it's a huge tone shift for the first two books. Um, this is by a local author called Bali Carl Joswell. And, you know, I this is the first book that I've read from her, I think. Um, but it really made such a great impression on me because I normally don't read novels. Uh, in the first chapter, I'm usually quite turned away by novels. Uh, and I find it very difficult to to find complexity in characters and, I, I, and I'm really forgetful, like, I really forget what characters are like who, you know, what, what are they doing, who are, how are they related to one another, like I forget that so easily. But in this one it was pretty clear, it was really straightforward. The only caveat that I had about the novel was like the pacing at the end seemed a little bit rushed but other than that, all the relationships in the story was so like heartwarming and it was a really heartwarming read. It was about a young lady, I feel like kind of similar to me, like, you know, um, parents who are, you know, um, who are from a diaspora. I mean, like the community that you're in is a diaspora and you know, there are all these like aunties, all these like middle-aged women um, that would hang a lot. Uh, and you know, it's a thing that like the middle-aged women often make the nucleus of the community because they're the ones that are like arranging things, organizing things, like getting people together, 
they're the ones that like keep up the news exchange the news and and you know like um yeah they're, they're really like the glue you know of diaspora communities and i really relate to that so it's about a young lady who who finds herself in this world of like these aunties who you know have their own stories have their own histories they have their own desires and it makes it makes them visible in their own right and it's like a feminism in a way that you know like if you were to describe feminism to like older women some of them might shy away from the term because they think they associate it with such like activism they associate it with like you know being unfeminine right you being like a masculine rejecting men you know, a lot of people have those pre- preconceptions of what feminism is like especially in, like older women but this book is really like what i would see as like women empowerment right Com- community based women empowerment through literacy but also through like community bonding through you know like years of knowing each other uh, years of like building up the community of like holding to your traditions and your heritage but also like this open intergenerational communication like bonds and interactions um it's a uh, like it's kind of like a perfect fairy tale but it is a story for a reason it's a novel and um i i guess i like stories where it's like people are good <laughs> like evil people are not like inherently evil i guess i prefer stories like that because i still want to believe that people are a good if you allow them the circumstances to thrive in a good way um but i also feel like when i read fiction i tend to read things that are like appealing to my inner child uh, maybe because i tend to choose non-fiction that's already a bit like messy and you know nuanced and all that so i don't want my fiction to be similarly complicated if not my brain will just go bust right um, <laughs> um but i i really really enjoyed it um highly recommend it i haven't had the chance to pick up the rest of her books uh but i will sometime soon so i'm really really glad um that this made it into my reading this year yeah but if you want to find similar books to that um i actually made a video on like novels similar to this like novels that um, you can also pick up so I'll link that down below the next book that I read um, that I want to recommend is called Islands of Abandonment by Carl Flynn so this is a non-fiction and it's sort of related to the climate in a very tangential way it's very environmental environmental in a very literal way um, because it is about environments it's about different habitats um, that well in the wild humans kind of intervened or it could be an urban setting that was abandoned by people it could be a mix of both it could be you know an island that was once a town and then now the domestic animals are now wild animals and i really like it it's about the fringes of environments um familiar environments that we know it's like the fringes of familiarity i really really enjoyed the flow of the whole book because even though the settings like the places that were visited can be really like obscure and quite irrelevant like some of them may seem very irre- irrelevant from the start but she was able to thread them all up together in a relatively coherent book talking about places that, that were abandoned and what that tells us about human civilization what that tells us about human um invasion interference both in a that you know like in natural settings or even in urban human settings um you know what is abandonment caused by humans right um the idea of wild and the idea of like unwild tame untamed um it becomes a bit blur in these like liminal spaces and you know there's a lot of ways like threads into like different ideas um there's there was a chapter that was about like you know um I think it was like nuclear waste and it brought up questions about you know what's ethical waste disposal um you know what is um ethical abandonment I guess in some senses what is ethical human intervention in natural uh, ecosystems and things like that which I really really appreciate that I feel like this is a book that would be great for people who um are very like very drawn by mystery but also very drawn by that liminality but who may not be very familiar with like thinking about environment or climate related questions i feel like it's a really good segue into those questions um 
simply from a very inquisitive point of view like it's a book that makes you feel very curious um and definitely one of the books that is like really up my alley in terms of like the writing in terms of like the topic in terms of how it raises a lot of questions but doesn't necessarily answer them kind of like leads you on uh, in your own way to think about you know similar liminal spaces that we've encountered um and of course it's like you know the list could go on forever i think that's the charm of the book um it's really like the mindset that you adopt when you see something new yeah so <laughs> that is like another book that i would really recommend uh, i guess like non-fiction wise like if it's a if generally people are asking me like what would be a good book to read as a non-fiction uh, i would actually put this as quite high up on the list um as a very interesting and fun non-fiction um thought-provoking one as well next i want to talk about another novel and it's called vacant steps by stephen sai now um this is like the second novel on my list and it and there are only two novels on my list <laughs> so vacant steps is kind of like a book that i never really thought i would enjoy it's kind of like fantasy kind of like I don't know how to describe novels, honestly. I'm really bad at describing novels. Um, but it is very fun and it's very interesting and it's very action packed. And again, with what I said about erotic stories about Punjabi women, I really enjoy stories where like characters thrive. So it is kind of like a YA novel, like you know, it's very classic, like coming of age, like you know, someone steps up to be a leader, someone leads their tribe, all right, to 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 win over the other tribes and it's like a lot of fighting between the different um, tribes I don't know whether they're called tribes but there's you know there's like people who are like tempted by evil and these are all like young people right and I remember when I first gave my review about this book in all of my wrap ups what I said that I really enjoyed about the book was the intergenerational elements of the book and how the young leaders uh, that were portrayed in the book uh, learned from their you know their parents learn from like the earlier generation of leaders they learn both the good and the bad because not all of them were good um, uh, leaders in that sense but the younger leaders they saw the older generation and some of them chose to honor some parts of the older generation some of them decided to do away with the sort of toxic traditions that they were expected to carry on. We follow like four main characters, right? Which can be very confusing, but um, each of the characters had a very clear like na uh, like narrative arc. So it wasn't too hard to follow along, um, and it was really satisfying when all of them sort of like all their stories sort of merged together at the end because we followed their stories a bit differently from the start. Like they all seem to have very separate narrative strands but as they came together and as the story sort of climaxed it was a very satisfying classic narrative right the build up the climax and the resolution and i really really liked the ending as well so to me it was kind of like a almost like a perfect story uh in a sense i i don't think it's necessarily complicated uh, but i do think it's kind of like a fable i don't think it's a book that you would seek out for you know, like really fantastic like action scenes or, or like really fantastic uh relationship studies. Like I don't think the relationship relationships between each characters were great and I also felt like the romantic arc was a bit of uh like a, a distraction. It was kind of very haphazardly put in i just felt like the romantic development of some of the characters were not really necessary but again you know these are just like parts of the story that perhaps will appeal to different people as you read them so uh, as a debut novel i thought this was great um another contender that i had for the top 10 books was also sufian hakim's book but in terms of like which story i enjoyed more i enjoyed steven's book um a lot more in terms of the plot but also the character development but they both had very similar vibes to me in the sense that they were more of like parables and they were more focused on family focused on this intergenerational um, idea um, of how do you carry on tradition but not you know bring over the toxic parts how do you honor your family and your past in, in a respectful and in a in a way that you know protects people in a way that protects your 
resources, your environment that doesn't destroy but creates thriving communities. I think at the heart of these two books, um, that's what I felt. Um, but in the end, I, I still recommend Vegan Steps to a whole bunch of y'all because I feel like y'all will enjoy this kind of really fantastical adventure <laughs> a lot more. So that is like the one, two, three, four, five, fifth book that I have. Next book I want to talk about is Global City Futures, Desire and Development in Singapore by Natalie Osmond. I'm not going to say too much about this book because I think I talked about it a lot in one of my earlier wrap-ups, but it's essentially a academic book. Um, it's about like housing policies in Singapore and it's about the idea of like querying people um, in Singapore as a way of uh, delegitimizing their like residency in Singapore so in a sense like not making for like people who are actually citizens some of them make sort of making them less of a citizen than people who can have the right to public housing or for even people who are transient workers here to kind of reinforce their transient status um, by sort of rendering them invisible in a lot of the housing policies that you have here or in sort of like the the way that we police spaces and the way that we police um, people's movements throughout the city so this is a, an example of queer queer geography um, in Singapore and Leslie also in like this book is not readily available in Singapore um, unfortunately but I'm sure you can find a copy online and another um, queer geographer that I want to recommend is Kamalini Ramdas, whose talk I attended during the Singapore's Writers Fest, which opened up my eyes to this whole idea of like queer geography and of like feminist readings of space in Singapore specifically. Even for myself to think about my long-term status in Singapore, how that is affected by the housing policies that I am eligible for. And it's a constant thought, right, that your housing is often tied to your citizenship how you make yourself visible as a citizen is through a lot of these things like yeah, housing, through like national service, through all these things that have never been contested for a long period of time. Um, yeah, so I think this book touches on that. So that is the next book that I want to talk about. Next book is Generation Dread, Finding Purpose in the Age of Climate Crisis by Brit Wee. I would say that I am not a fan of this book because of Brit Wee. But I am a fan of this book because of the people that she's included in her research in, in this book. Particularly um, in the chapter that she talks about reproductive ethics in the age of climate crisis. Um, she has talked to quite a number of indigenous activists, to black communities uh, in the US specifically, had all these like interesting conversations about reproduction, right? About how a lot of uh, people uh, unwilling to reproduce, uh, unwilling to bring their future children into this world uh, because they're afraid that the world uh, is no longer viable, no longer survivable for their children. And this was a book that changed my attitude on that because I used to believe that yeah, it is extremely unethical to bring children into this world. Um, but a lot of these indigenous and black activists uh, or even just you know communities were saying that you know to bring a child into this world is is not an act of like uh, how do I say this like it's, it's an act of survival right um, because time and time again the way that communities uh, kind of disappear is because there's no next generation to not have children is the ultimate form of defeat in that sense right and that the resilience lies in the fact that there is enough trust in your community and enough trust in your culture to protect future future generations um, of your people, uh, and and I think when I started to think about it that way, that you know having children is, you know of course uh, again it's also an idea of like personal responsibility that actually if you don't have a child it's not really on you to not have a child just because you don't want to contribute to climate change. Um, honestly, having children is not something that um, we should burden people with uh, choosing or not choosing because. Ultimately, the human population, the human civilization can only persist till today because people have had children against the odds, right? People have had children during the wartime. People have, have had children during whatever difficult situation. Um, and that had, that was the main reason why things were able to continue because there were people, future generations, 
that would continue the work. This was a book that really changed my mindset on that. Not saying that personally now it has changed my mind that I must have children, but it definitely edged me away from the thinking that, you know, how, you know, of, of like looking at children in today's world and finding it extremely sad that they're going to grow up in this world. Uh, now I just feel a lot more like, okay, they're going to be here anyway. Uh, let's go and do something to make it a little bit easier for them to live. So yeah, so that is the book that I would recommend, especially for people who de are dealing with climate anxiety. I think it's a very useful book. But of course, not because of the author, not because of Brit Wei, but really because of the people that she interviewed and the people that she brought in. A lot of it was about the reproductive ethics part. So people who might not be interested in that may not find the book completely interesting. Uh, but I do think there were a lot of gems inside. But again, because I, I had been reading about these things quite a lot, it wasn't a lot of new information for me. Again, it's written from someone who is from the Global North and deals a lot of the psychological impacts of climate anxiety and not necessarily like someone who is actually quite literally facing the consequences of like flooding and all that. The next book uh, that I want to talk about is Black Waters and Pink Sands by Ng Yi Sheng. This is a local publication. It has two plays in it. The first one is uh, Aya Itam. And the second one I think is like I forgot the second name, ah, but um, uh, it's a, uh, the second play is about like a retelling of the history of queer theatre in Singapore. The first one, I Itam, was kind of co-produced by uh, Ergi Sheng, he was the producer, director, I think, and then and an actor in Singapore who is black and talks quite openly about, you know, being black in Singapore and about black communities in Singapore, and so it was really interesting to see um, the play talking about the histories uh, of black communities and how they've been um, intersecting with colonialism in this area and also just like trade routes and trying to find the histories right um people you know have all these like narratives and all these preconceptions of like different minority groups and the idea of history being entangled in a lot of ways like we might think that oh you know like uh, African Americans oh they exist you know in America, you might think that, oh, you know, black people only exist in certain parts of the world, but, you know, there's a lot of entanglements with history from way back, um, communities from way back uh, that have been affected, that have been sort of um, influenced by trade routes, by, you know, different economic opportunities, by cultural, you know, exchanges and all that. The second play was similarly like a historical re retelling, and it was so interesting to see all the different authors, I guess, like playwrights uh, being put together in one play. and. Um, the, these two plays were put together uh, because they were sort of performance lectures which I think Ng Yi is quite known for putting up in Singapore. I found the format really entertaining but also really educational and informative and it was, you know, as compared to watching it live, which they did put up by the way, these two plays were performed at some point, um, but reading the, the manuscript and being able to see the different footnotes, being able to see the research that um, Ng Yi put together for both the plays. It was a completely like informational, like very, very educational experience. And the fact that there's so much history, um, it's just a matter of how you look at things. I think Ng Yi is really, really good at um, bringing about these histories. I think he has mentioned them as like, not not really say like alternative histories, but he's really good at like, you know, piecing together narratives that people might not have thought about as much, um, but are very much present very much just waiting for people to tell and I would highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in like Singapore history or even just like Singapore theatre. Um, I find this a very really great work, uh, performance lecture and I think uh, there's quite a lot of people who like to do performance lectures in Singapore as well. I think because there's a lot of education to be done um, in alternative stories and histories in Singapore so I think there is quite a you know, vibrant like performance lecture style. Uh, way of performing in Singapore. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the last two books, Before My Battery Dies. My battery is dying. Okay, quick. The second last book I want to talk about is Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers, Monstrosity, Patriarchy, and The Fear of Female Power by Sadie Doyle. Um, this was a book that I saw on my friend's like IG story, and I had to read it because it was about like this idea of like the female archetype as being extremely, extremely like petrifying. And uh, earlier in the year, I did read um, Running of the Wolves, right? Um, 
and it's a story about like myths about the women in myths and, and what that reveals about like our hidden fears about the women the hidden fears of like femininity this book came at such a great time because it was really precisely about like how we understand the female archetype through the stories that we tell through the histories that we tell through the, the, the through the kind of characters that we hold on to and what's really great about this author is that they provided so many different examples to look at them and it was one of the books that really started to ignite in me this idea of like the feminine as being somewhat mystical somewhat mysterious and somewhat supernatural in a way that I never thought about because you know I've always been someone that's like oh yeah you know like I, I like to read nonfiction, I like to read things of, about science but at the same time I also really really appreciate um, you know this idea of uh, the beyond human things that we don't understand as humans like stories that we hold on to and make such a profound impact on us that we cannot explain I also believe very strongly in that and so this book really helped to kind of articulate a lot of those ideas especially ideas of like why is it that patriarchy persists so much as a system even though we understand that we understand that power is different we understand that the power somehow feels very restrained in patriarchy like why is there so much effort in trying to police the feminine uh, and also the idea of masculinity what really is that we haven't had those conversations we're just like oh you know like we're, we are starting to open conversations about like gender identity gender expression but you know we haven't really had the chance to really go back to this idea of like what is the divine feminine what is the divine masculine um you know we had we used to have all these rituals all these like magic that would surround um these you know feminine or masculine qualities or even this like non-binary or like gender fluidity we used to have all these things that would honor these different qualities but because we've been rational for so long we now don't have the words or the experiences to really like to really like bask in these qualities anymore and i feel like we're only beginning to really understand like how is it possible to tap into those um qualities in that empowering way right not just like hey you're a woman now you have the same economic potential as everyone else but rather how do we then talk about you know different types of gender expression how do we then talk about why is it that patriarchy still exists on such a fundamentally like psychological level on such a like in an emotional level as well um, even though maybe the surface level it may not look so oppressive materially but i still feel like psychologically there's a lot to unpack and i think i'm still trying to understand this but that brings me to my last book the last book i want to talk about is called bitch a revolutionary guide to sex evolution and the female animal now when i mentioned the earlier book i i still am very confused by this whole like supernatural and beyond human thing this book is the book that gave me a potentially like evolutionarily interesting perspective on the whole issue i did talk about this book quite a lot in my uh, previous wrap up so you can think about that a little bit more there but basically it gives evolutionary theories on why is it that you know we now have these ideas of why the male seems to dominate over the female a lot and a lot of these things are actually human preconceived ideas it's actually misconceptions by male scientists in the past to think about the male as dominating the female in the natural world there are a lot of cases where species have evolved either you know as a female dominated sort of like you know uh, population species etc or have evolved from primarily like female dominated ways of organizing and reproducing so it is kind of scary to think about it that way like in a way that you know we now have enough science and research to speculate that actually the default of a lot of like you know species the way that these organize is actually female dominated and the idea of female in itself is also very tenable because what what defines a female biologically genetically it varies a lot across a lot of sp different species so the idea is that you know if humans did actually evolve from a female dominated species uh, kind of organization method system why is it that today patriarchy is the overarching kind of societal system that we live in these two books i think they'll do great together if you want to read them together 
but those are my last two books. Okay, we've come to the end of <laughs> the top 10 books and my battery is dying. I only have one more minute left on my camera. But thank you so much for watching and do let me know if any of these books will make it into your reading list next year. I expect a lot of these books to be good. Uh, a lot of them were sort of chance encounters. Like I didn't actually know about them before the year arrived. So it's really interesting to see how my reading turned out. But I'm very, very happy that I read these books. Um, definitely books that I will remember for a long period of time uh, and opened up a lot of new inquiries for me. So I always love seeing sort of my conclusion for the year and seeing what new threads opened up for me in each of the years. So thank you so much for watching once again. I hope this wasn't too chaotic. I kind of had to rush through the last two books because my battery was dying and now I'm recording on my computer. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll see you in the next year. Don't know whether I'll create a TBR because honestly, every time I make a TBR for the new year, I I think this year I managed to hit most of them, but I think next year will be a pretty difficult year for me because a lot of changes in my life, as usual, but more than usual. Um, so we'll see about that. But thank you all again for you know, being book, book nerds with me. I freaking love it. Um, take care. Have a great holiday. Have a happy new year. Have a great 2023. I wish you all the best. Beautiful, bountiful 2023. You deserve it. So please rest well, drink lots of water, take care, stay indoors if you can, uh, get some sun. I know that's contradictory. But I think getting some sun would be good for you. <laughs> okay, bye and see you. Ooh.